star in Santa Cruz. This is Pacifica Radio's Letters and Politics. On today's show... You're fighting these counterinsurgencies all around the world. You know, America is. From the Vietnam War to Latin America. All these proxy wars. Proxy wars where the, there are no armies, really. There are guerrilla forces. They're frequently embedded in civilian populations. This guy named Ethiel de Solapool, who was an ARPA contractor for, for ARPA, uh, which, is the, which we now know as DARPA, that built the Internet in, in, the, in the 60s. And he was this very well-known MIT um, sort of theoretician and uh, sociologist about using systems to manage societies and, to, and, and, and how to kind of manage a, a, a high-tech, a technocratic world. And so he envisioned a kind of a technocratic utopia, right, where nothing, so there's no privacy, really, but there's also no conflict and there's no war because you could, you could allow technocrats like him to get a handle on what's going on. A conversation on the history of the Internet and its connection to the military. Our guest is investigative reporter Yasha Levine. He is the author of the book Surveillance Valley, The Secret Military History of the Internet. That's next on Letters on Politics. But first, the news. For Pacifica Radio, I'm Christina Onestead. As many as 3,000 school walkouts and related events took place yesterday across the country to mark the one-month anniversary of the deadly shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida that left 17 students and faculty dead. Actions held 17 minutes of silence to mark each person killed. Tens of thousands of students and teachers participated in the walkout. In Oakland, Carolyn Tears, a student at Oakland Tech, spoke out. This is an issue of human lives. No more lives should be lost because the cowards in our government will protect the Second Amendment over the lives of American citizens. Meanwhile, the House overwhelmingly approved a modest bill to improve school safety, the first gun-related action by Congress since the shooting that left 17 dead at the Florida High School. The bill authorizes $500 million over 10 years for grants to improve training and coordination between schools and local law enforcement, and it helps to identify signs of potential violence before it occurs. Here's Democratic Representative Ted Deutsch of Florida. The problem of gun violence in America is a uniquely American problem. It's an epidemic. It's a complex problem. There are many facets, but we know what we need to do. And I am committed to taking any step to getting any new policy across the finish line that will make our kids safer. This bill, the Stop School Violence Act, is a good bill. It will not solve our gun problem, but it will help troubled students that need help get help and it will help teachers and law enforcement identify potential threats before it's too late. The measure now goes to the Senate where a similar measure is being considered. The Trump administration is imposing sanctions on 19 Russians for alleged interference in the 2016 U.S. election, including 13 indicted by special counsel Robert Mueller. The Treasury Department says the Russian military intelligence agency GRU and Russia's military both interfered in the American election. The administration is also targeting the Internet Research Agency that Mueller says orchestrated much of the cyber meddling in the 2016 election. The Trump administration move comes just days after Democrats slammed the president for not implementing sanctions against Russians known to have interfered in the 2016 presidential election. Meanwhile, the U.S., France and Germany have joined Britain today in blaming Russia for poisoning a former spy with a powerful nerve agent, calling it an assault on U.K. Sovereign sovereignty and a breach of international law. In a rare joint statement, U.S. President Donald Trump, French President, German Chancellor and British Prime Minister said there's no plausible alternative explanation to Russian responsibility. Today, President Trump spoke on the issue. It looks like it. I spoke with the Prime Minister, and we are uh, in deep discussions, a very sad situation. It certainly looks like the Russians were behind it, uh, something that should never, ever happen. And we're taking it very seriously, as I think are many others. 
U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. yesterday, Nikki Haley, called for the U.N. Security Council to hold Russia accountable. Meanwhile, British officials are less diplomatic, like Gavin Williamson, U.K.'s defense secretary. Frankly, Russia should go away. It should shut up. In a joint letter, world leaders said Russia failure to respond to Britain's legitimate request for an explanation further underlines its responsibility in the attack in southern England. Russia denies involvement in the attack. And today marks seven years of Syria's civil war. Hundreds of civilians streamed out of a town in Syria's besieged opposition held enclave of eastern Ghouta today, hours after Syrian government forces blanketed the town with airstrikes and rocket fire. More than 1,200 civilians have been killed in government and Russian airstrikes and rocket fire in recent weeks. I'm Christina Onestead. Letters and Politics is next. Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich and I'm very happy to welcome to our radio studio Yasha Levine. Yasha Levine is an investigative journalist and he's just written a book that we are going to be in conversation about. It is called Surveillance Valley, the Secret Military History of the Internet. Yasha Levine, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And Surveillance Valley, I guess that's a play on Silicon Valley? Yes, yeah. uh, exactly. I mean, it's surveillance is what drives it, not silicon anymore. I, I have pretty much been married to my Gmail account now for some 12 years. Um, and it's almost become my de facto Rolodex, right? I mean, you got this great search option on it and just everything I need comes right up. Tell me what I'm missing about Gmail. Well, you know, I, I, you probably already know and most people are somewhat aware of the fact that obviously not only do you have your entire correspondence there, um, as you would in any email program where you don't delete anything. Google mines that information to build a profile of you and uh, combines that with other information it has about you, uh, your search history, uh, your browsing history. Uh, if you're using Chrome, uh, it, re it, record, it remembers your browsing history as well and can tie it to your, to your profile. And of course, if you have an Android phone or use any Google app, even if it's an iPhone, um, you know, whether it's a map pro program or Gmail on your computer on your on your iPhone. I mean, it knows where you are at any given moment. And so, taking all of those sources, you know, taking all those things, who you talk to, what you talk about, where you, you know, what, what the kinds of things you search for, wh what kind of websites you go to, and where you are at any given moment, and you know, and where you've been for the last ten years, you know, gives you a pretty good idea of what a person is like and and who their friends are and uh, what they're interested. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's of course because you you can search it, right? It's stored, it's and it's not just stored; it's analyzed. And Google, there is no there is no restriction on what Google can do with that data and how it can analyze it and what it can extract from the from the data. So there are no limitations at all. I mean, is there that are no, because something Congress has never taken up? There's there's no regulations around this. There's there are no regulations on what Google can do with your data. Um, so it's um, yeah, it's it's very strange given that. You know these com well it's not so strange maybe uh, is that these companies d d their their lifeblood is, is the data so any attempt to regulate uh, or rein in uh, their um, not just collection of data but e uh, analysis of the data would put a big threat to put their business model under threat and so they've of course uh, done all sorts of things to prevent this from happening uh, from lobbying to astroturf, uh, you know, campaigns um, to redirecting people's privacy concerns to things that don't look at Silicon Valley but look at more of the NSA and the government and so making the government the evil guy uh, while not really paying attention at all about what Silicon Valley is doing. Monitoring and, and knowing and having a history of our web browsing <laughs> is interesting to me, always has been. Is it just Google's doing that's doing it, or are all the the web browsers doing it? Well, I mean, I think all the companies are doing it uh, to some degree. Um, even even companies like Amazon or eBay and Netflix, you know, companies that aren't directly um, companies whose business models aren't directly tied to uh, surveillance, because you know, Facebook and Google and Twitter, they are they there is no other business for them. Surveillance is the business because they do targeting advertising, and in order to show us the most targeted advertising, to, to increase the chances that we would l click on an ad and, would, and make the money, right? They, in order to increase these chances, they they create these very sophisticated profiles of of, of who we are and what our interests are, and so uh, it's very much part of their business. If they weren't allowed to do that, their business uh, would 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 crater, uh, and their value, the stock value, would, would crater. 
Um, but also companies like Amazon and Netflix also track what their users are doing in order to enhance their business. You know, so Netflix, for instance, uses watches what you, you know, watches what you watch, right? right. It, 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 and yeah, exactly. It's the watch of the watchers. Right? <laughs> Netflix watches the watchers and they, and they even, they're even starting to uh, base show ideas or, or the, 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 uh, the viability of a certain show or a concept based on you know, people's uh, habits of what they watch and what kind of things they're interested in. And so they're developing these, these kind of, it's kind of interesting. It's pretty interesting. It's an algorithmic way of trying to guess what, what shows will be successful, future shows. And so, uh, they're playing around with that. Of course, Amazon, wants to know um, exactly what people are interested in so that it can stock things uh, and it can and can reduce its... Are all these different companies sharing with each other? No, no. I mean, that is very... The, the data is very valuable. Yeah. And uh, they build businesses on top of that data. And so based on that data, you know, they rent that data out, essentially. You know, uh, Facebook and Google, they, they, they rent out their use, the users, that user platforms, but also the data is... Uh, rented by whoever's buying the ads because yeah. the, the determination of who to show the ad is based on that data. And so, no, they don't. It's every, that, that is a huge asset to these companies. And uh, and in, in a way, it's also a barrier to entry at, to smaller companies who have to contend with, um, like a search engine would probably be much more difficult to compete with Google because Google now not only has, you know, a lot of money and a lot of resources, but it also has the data that can it, it, it's constantly using to improve its, um, its, its uh, search algorithm. No, it's an asset. It's a very, very valuable asset. I'm going to come at you like a novice here because, one, I am <laughs> on this stuff. And, and, two, I imagine there are many people in the listening audience who are as well. And the reason I asked if, if they share, I think we've all had that strange experience if you are on either one app or just one other browser or, or website and you're doing something there and then you go to a – then maybe you go to your Facebook account or something and then the advertisements – start showing up of where you were yeah before no, yeah. yeah yeah definitely I and mean, it's because it depends on what you know it depends on what kind of ad network is showing you the ads and so usually when you're we're browsing there's like a lot of different systems that are tracking our, our browsing um uh, habits and if we're going if we go and look at some product or search for a product or something on an amazon you know that gets stored in a cookie file or it gets re recorded by the by by the companies that are tracking our um internet browsing and but because the same systems are um, being used uh, to serve ads in on different platforms, you know that information follows us around. So it, be, it, it might be strange. You might be on some app uh, that's not connected to Google. It seems like, but then you well, you go to Google, you search for something, and yet in, in that app, the, the you know that that interest suddenly pops up, and that's because most likely it's the Go Go Google's advertising sort of engine is powering both of those things, and so. Google um, um, allows you know, people who make apps uh, to make money off of advertising in their apps, right? And so, because Google is like one of the largest uh, digital advertising um, entities uh, yeah. in the world, they uh, offer, you know, they, they will use Google's underlying um, engine. And so, that, that information gets carried across. And yeah. so, what we're seeing, you know, is just a kind of a tip of the iceberg of actually what's going on behind the scenes. So, what, what is what the capability here, you know, um, because it can, you can, you're tracked across multiple devices, across multiple platforms, across multiple apps. It doesn't even matter, you know, what, what you do anymore. It's just, I recently booked a hotel room for Athens and now every time, whether if it's Facebook, Gmail, my chess app that I like to put, it doesn't matter. I'm bombarded with hotel offers now. It's funny because you, you already booked it, so you don't yeah, need it. I don't even need it. That's why, I, yeah, exactly. No, no, that's, that's, the, that's the funny part about these uh, data systems. You know, it's supposedly they're supposed to empower and give you a sense of exactly what people are doing and give you this sort of total information awareness of the world. But when it gets down to it, they're pretty dumb. You, you, they don't even know when you, when you bought the thing. You know, it's like to just not show it to you anymore because it's just, it's annoying. You know, it's why would you... If you bought something already, okay, you were interested. But if you so so, yeah, there's a lot. So there's there's limits on what it knows. And or, or I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh, I wish I would have saw that before. Exactly, there's <laughs> a better Thanks. deal than I got. You make me feel you make me feel really <laughs> crappy about you know my ability to uh, bargain shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Yasha Levine, your your book though, Surveillance Valley, is about what you call the secret military history of the internet. And, and I want to get into that. I want to dive into ARPA and DARPA, the Vietnam War, and work our way forward up to today. But is there a military aspect that we should know about about this dynamic that we're, we're we've talked about so far. Well, I mean, of course, the, the, there's a military aspect. Um, you know, um, this is why the NSA has the Prism program, in which it partners with um, the biggest Silicon Valley companies to um, 
to get at the at the data in, in the, on their platforms is because it sees these platforms uh, and the data streams that they contain about people and uh, their movements and their interests as a very as a vital source of intelligence for the for the na for national security. And I believe uh, James Clapper, you know, called uh, the Prism program and uh, Prism's ability to get at Google data one of the most important um, sources of of information that they use in the you know daily briefs da daily intelligent briefs for, for the uh, for the president do they even and, have to go through like a fisa court that's something we've been hearing a lot about concerning warrants i mean supposedly i mean, I mean this is all secret so if you don't yeah. know that's okay no, i mean in theory you're supposed to go to fisa court but yeah. you know they just recently uh re uh, reauthorized the fisa uh F FISA court and and they expanded it so that you don't as far as I understand it you don't in many cases you don't even need you don't need a warrant um, to spy on Americans anymore because uh, it's it's very strange but yeah look we don't the NSA and of course the CIA and the, these are some of the most secretive agencies in the world I mean we don't we don't know what goes on and and what we think we know is going on is also based on information that is leaked by some people that are associated with it or some documents that that came out of these agencies and so a lot of the information that we have of these agencies is comes from the agencies themselves and it always has to be taken with a grain of salt it always has to be um analyzed and, and uh you never know if you're being manipulated or not you know because again their spies are in the business of deception right and so and so just because there's a document that says something doesn't necessarily mean it's true so i mean maybe it is true but you know we have to kind of use we have to situate it in, in, in what what else we know about, about these agencies and about the political situation around it. And theoretically, yes, there should be a warrant. But as Edward, some of Edward Stone's documents showed, um, there are also programs that are do, do, doing this illegally in, or, you know, quote unquote, in, illegally because it's not really illegal because the NSA can do it. It's mandated to do it. It um, broke into and hacked into the uh, fiber optic cables that connected Google's and Yahoo's uh, data center. So you know, they have their own data centers that are spread around the world, and so they communicate with each other. And so it's an internal internet, sort of a Google internal internet. And just the NSA just like dug a hole, you know, in the ground uh, where that fiber optic cable ran, and just like spliced it open, and just grabbed everything that was moving across the network. And so uh, when you have access like that, I don't know what uh, what kind of warrant you need or not not need. Right. Um, maybe there's some protections built in, but I, I seriously doubt it. Is surveillance that is involved with these companies and, and the internet, was that idea there at the beginning of the internet and the development of the internet? Oftentimes we hear about the internet and you write this in your book that there are several different narratives out there and maybe we talk about those but sort of this free platform where everyone can go and you know you have this certain amount of freedom. That wasn't the narrative though I got from no. from your book. <laughs> I mean, there, there, there's there's many different threads that go into creating a, a you know a complicated technology like the internet. Um, it's you know its development from the 1960s uh, to today. You know, it spanned almost half a century. So it's there's a lot of forces that went into it. But uh, the a dominant force, one that doesn't really get enough attention or almost any attention in the histories of the internet, is the the uh, it's it's its role uh, as a counterinsurgency information weapon. The idea at the time was you're fighting these counterinsurgencies all around the world, you know, America is, from the Vietnam War to Latin America. All these proxy wars. Proxy wars where the there are no armies, really. There are guerrilla forces. They're frequently embedded in civilian populations. Um, and you had the same thing in America in the 60s and 70s. You know, you had this really powerful anti-war movement. You had militant uh, black activists, uh, you know, we had Weather riots. Underground. Yes, right. Weather Underground. Yes, Weather Underground. They were planning bombs, and they were going off almost every day, not just the Weather Underground, but other groups as well. You had, you know, you had a radical sort of activists who seemed to be, you know, united in sort of hating America, right, and, and being critical of America and being critical of American foreign policy, being critical of the capitalist system, being critical of the oppression, oppression of, of people of color. Um, and, you know, uh, they saw a kind of global insurgency, not just abroad, but at home, right? And th what, 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 what made this war different was that you couldn't really, I mean, maybe some generals really want, wanted to do it, but you couldn't really just march in a tank, a tank division and just, like, annihilate everybody, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, or you couldn't just drop a nuke on it, you know? Uh, because... Sure, that would solve the problem, but that would also just kill everybody. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think some people wanted to do that. You know, um, but 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 there was another way possible, uh, which was you deploying, creating and deploying uh, advanced 
the computer technology and uh, that could uh, it was believed could monitor society could you could ingest I, data on society you can ingest uh, you know profiles of people uh, their you know their uh, their draft record their military their criminal histories their their education histories their work histories you can combine that with uh, knowledge of who they're friends with right you could and extrapolate this stuff you can uh, combine it with knowledge about certain communities and uh, leaders in those communities and and who was involved in what political movement and the idea, and then you could sort of run these models on them and and, and analyze this data in sophisticated ways in, which would allow you to say okay here's the problem and these people are the problem these people are okay so what we need to do is we need to target these people and um and then we can isolate the threat and and then the the the, the idea at the time was that you know, maybe some decades down the line, uh, when this computer technology is built and can actually be deployed in, in, in a sophisticated way, you can have a, a system of control uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a bigger level, like a system that can sit on top of the world and regulate it. You, a system like, it's almost like the idea of a radar defense network, uh, for, you know, like something like NORAD, for human society writ large so you can watch it and you can respond to threats you can see where someone is upset and maybe meet them halfway give them a little bit of a you know if there are people rebelling against they're ha- unhappy because they're uh don't have land and they're being squeezed by their landlord somewhere in, somewhere in south america you're like well let's let's talk to those guys let's talk to the to to that government let's get have them do a little bit of land reform so that we can you know we can uh, we can decrease that threat level and so you, this idea of, 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 of sort of watching the battlefield and looking at the world as this system that could be managed yeah. centrally almost, you know, from, from Washington in a more humane way. You don't and have that's to bomb how they, them. Yeah, I get that. It yeah. can go either way, right? But, well, if, if, it's, if, they can't, if they can't uh, intercept the threat early enough, well, you know. You can't pacify them. <laughs> well, you know, you do what you got to do. But, but, yeah, and this was pretty clear. I mean, so you have one of these guys that um, this guy named Ethel de Solapool who was an ARPA uh, who was a contractor for for ARPA, uh, which is the which we now know as DARPA, uh, that 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 built the internet in, in, the, in the 60s, and he was this uh, very well known MIT um, sort of theoretician uh, sociologist about uh, using computer using systems to manage societies and to and 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 how to kind of manage a, a, a high tech a technocratic world, um, and he. Worked on several different um, systems uh, w- that uh, sought to build a computer technology that could do this, that could build um, um, underlying tools that could make make management of large data sets possible. And so you could, and so and so he saw it. You know, if you read his writings, he he talked about it like this. He said, like, the problem with the world is that it's not managed being managed well, and we do, we we can't manage it well because there's secrecy. We can't see everything. We can't know everything. And that secrecy. Um, on like, on on a personal level, but also on like a government level. So you know, the U.S. doesn't know what the Soviet Union is really thinking. You know, uh, like what are they really thinking? So we have to guess. So we have to play these sort of so game it theories. Sounds like Cold War. Yeah, or it sounds like a game game theory. Game yes, theory. you got to like game. But like, what if we knew? Yeah. Then you know, then it wouldn't be a game guessing game. They wouldn't have to deploy all these. You know, potentially start a nuclear war because we guessed it wrong. And so he envisioned. Uh, you know, a kind of a technocratic utopia, right? Where nothing, so there's no privacy, really. Um, but there's also no conflict and there's no war because you could, you could allow technocrats like him and, and, and um, to get a handle on what's going on. And, uh, and it would be for the best, you know? And so, and that was very explicit, you know, like in the writings and, 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 and thinking of people back then. Can you give me ago. his name again. Ethel de Sola Pool. He's, he's pretty interesting. He's an interesting character, you know? And uh, he was... Um, he uh, one of the things that he did was he ran. Um, he was a pioneer in using polling and uh, running computer um, analysis on, um, on 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 to run um, uh, political campaigns. So he worked on uh, John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign, and he ran these sort of tests about messaging. He tested various um, various uh, messaging, um, uh, you know, to different populations, and he used uh, computer technology to to run predictive models on how it would be received. And so he was a big deal. He was very well known back then, and he um, in the '60s, uh, and he uh, even inspired like a best-selling uh, thriller novel um, about um, you know the sort of shadowy sort of the sort of shadowy uh, technocrats who can who can use computers and data to convince people to vote for the sort of like bad you know bad politician who was, was going like, to destroy the world. And so it was he was he was he inspired you know fear. What novel was that? It's called the 480. 
the 480. Yeah, which ba- based on the number of number of data points that his uh, da- firm used to you know model um, voter behavior. Ethel Disipol. Ethel, di- so it's it, <laughs> yeah. He comes from this really. Uh, it's a Spanish name. Uh, he comes from a very well known uh, like uh, family from from Spain that I can trace its roots back to um, medieval times. Mm. It's he's a pretty interesting character, and he is a he is a representative of the kind of thinking that you uh, you had at the time about about computer systems and computer networks. And so the ARPA the ARPANET, which the, the network that became the internet was born out of this general philosophical and ideological environment. Um, of course, at the time, it wasn't this thing. It wasn't the Internet. It wasn't like following people around. It was, at the time, it was just trying to build the basic, basic tools that could make right. that happen. Um, How did he foresee this working then, that you were able to get all that information? I mean, obviously, this is your suggesting this is 50 years before you have Facebook and Twitter and and Gmail and all these things so so how did he how do you see this network being able to track all this information from users all over the world um that's a good question I mean I think that you know he would uh, uh, I'm not sure if I've read anything where he envisioned how the the, the method um, that would be used I think that he just believed that it, it would it would it would there would be one yeah. uh, because because at the time it was already clear that you know you could have stuff like that you could already start to um, intercept, you know, um, news reports or news bulletins and, you know, have a early, really early, early technology that was able to be able to transcribe it, you know. Um, and you could, so you could envision, you know, something like that happening. You know, if you can do this for, for you know, uh, wire reports that, you know, the AP was sending, you know, over the wire, you can probably do that for telephone conversations. You could do that for other other things, mail. So, and if people then use the system to communicate, then you could have that um, obviously be the input. Uh, but he... He was thinking on a more of a theoretical uh, level, you know, um, where, not the practical. I think people just believed that it would it, it'd be possible, you know. Yeah. yeah be, just, because, well, just like, you know, radar was invented to track um, airplanes, and then radar then was connected to computers, and then if you, you can directly feed that information to a computer that can analyze it. So it wouldn't be that complicated. That, it wasn't that far of a leap. No, to, no, to no. About. To think about people as just entities that can be watched, right? It's It wasn't, it wasn't at all... Um, Again, it was it was it was uh, cutting edge uh, because you kind of had to be it. You know, most people weren't thinking that way, but people who were close to that world that was uh, developing that technology and was using that technology uh, in military and, and some in some academic circles that were close to the military, it was obvious to them that it was, it was headed that way, and it was also obvious to regular people at the time, which I found very surprising in researching the in researching the book when I got into the archives and I started looking at trying to understand public response to these programs, um, um, to the ARPA net program in, spe- in particular, I was surprised to find that going back to 1969, student activists uh, from Students for a Democratic Society at MIT and Harvard um, were protesting against the ARPA net, right? Yeah. The, internet, the network that would become the internet as a surveillance tool. And, yeah. they, and they, they, were, they very explicitly called it that. And they said that this will, if this thing is allowed to expand and isn't checked, um, it will allow um, uh, Washington's, you know, policemen, right, to better control the world, to better uh, sort of fight popular movements uh, in third world countries, uh, it, it, it better control populations. And so back in 1969, they saw these e- networking efforts as tools of social control and liberation. They didn't look at networks or computers as tools of liberation, which is how people, you know, in the 80s and 90s began to see them. And yeah, it was it was it was pretty interesting. I mean, they because they are were very aware of of, of something that we've lost uh, over the over the past three decades, and uh, something that seems so shocking to people now was actually kind of obvious to just students, you know. Uh, and um, it it just goes to show how how like how I don't know how I I guess the the easiest way to put it would be history is written by the victors. Victors are clearly n- not me and you, <laughs> uh, but you know, people like uh, Jeff Bezos and, and, um, and um, you know, Sergey Brin and Larry Page and Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. And they are the, clearly the victors. You know, they are the richest gonna, people in the world. Are they going to write the history? They've written the history. You know? and, and so you know, part of what I've... I didn't start out this way, uh, writing the book, but when I got into it, I realized that what I'm doing actually is trying to recover history that has already been told in a, in a way. Uh, that people knew just, you know, 30, 40 years ago. History, uh, history is always a battle against forgetting. Yes, and power. What's remembered yes. and what's not. It's a very political process. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. History is political and it's always about fighting power because power wants to bend history to its, to its, 
to its own needs, all right? And um, and clearly Silicon Valley and, and, you know, these technology companies are the dominant power in the world. I mean, they are the ascendant power. And so they've written the history and um, and they've convinced us to believe them, right? And we've, we've, we've all... We've all been duped in a big in a big way, and so my attempt here is to attempt to recover some of that lost history, and to because we can't grapple with what the internet is today, and to try to like get a political hold on it somehow if we don't know its origins, right? And um, I think yeah, it was it was really inspiring actually to 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 get into some of that stuff because I felt like I was. I don't know, like it was like um, discovering some long, long lost civilization. You know? I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> we are in conversation with Yasha Levine. He is an investigative journalist. He's the author of a new book, which is called Surveillance Valley, the Secret Military History of the Internet. So much of this drama that you're talking about in the 1960s and the late 1960s and even the protests that's ha- happening, uh, is, it's all happening at Stanford University. Yeah, it's a it's a big it's a big part of um, it's a big player uh, in the ARPANET story and the Internet story. Um, but MIT is also a huge player, um, and UCLA is a player, and all of those uh, universities were targeted by protesters uh, mm-hmm. who were who were trying to shut down um, military research uh, on their campuses. And Stanford is particularly interesting because it's. Uh, So it was home to the Stanford Research Institute, which at the time was part of the university. Uh, Now it's been spun off as a private um, military contractor slash think tank, SRI, they call themselves now. Um, And SRI, the Stanford Research Institute, was a major uh, contractor uh, for ARPA uh, in in the 1960s on counterinsurgency technology uh, in the Vietnam War. They were also developing chemical weapons, and they were uh, developing chemical weapons for use in Vietnam. Uh, at the same time, you know, just down the hall, you had people working on the Internet. <laughs> and the two things were actually connected um, because they're connected to, counter, to counterinsurgency and fighting insurgencies and figuring out ways of new weapons t- to fight insurgencies, whether it's chemical warfare, <laughs> which is, you know, a pretty brutal way of doing it, or uh, a more targeted, you know, information weapon that could uh, help um, help uh, isolate the uh, and predict um, um you know, problem populations. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Stanford and the Bay Area are, play a big role in in the sort of the darker side of the history of the Internet. And um, it's it's still very much there, you know. Um, you know. How, how do we go from, and maybe it's one and the same in some way, but how do we go from then this, the, this Internet, an early n- Internet that is meant as a counterinsurgency tool, uh, to one that we oftentimes associate with hackers and rebels and people that are fighting the system? It's a good question. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting story, um, the re- rebranding of it. Um, you know, a central, a central character in this rebranding of the, of the Internet, uh, rebranding it, you know, f- rebranding a military technology built by military contractors into something egalitarian and democratic. You know, th- it's a st- story that spans... About three decades, starting starting from the '70s, and you know, probably ending in the '90s, and, and where it's it's the rebranding had, had taken full effect, and where uh, people didn't even remember the the previous military history. Central character in that story is this guy named Stuart Brand, who is a very well known uh, um, sort of a guy who went to Stanford, and he was well known. He's known primarily for the whole Earth Catalog. It's sort of this sort of hippie bible, right, of the commune movement. Um, and he, you know, hang out with, hung out with the Merry Pranksters. You know, he dropped acid. He was also very much uh, involved uh, and friends with um, uh, people who were working uh, as contractors for ARPA, building the ARPANET in Stanford. And he, and he helped. Um, he wrote this amazing um, um, story for Rolling Stone in 1972. At the same time that Hunter Thompson was writing for it, right? And he wrote this incredible story that, that I think set the tone for uh, how we view the Internet today. And he went and hung out uh, at Stanford at this lab where they were building, you know, robots and building these sort of networks and building, uh, you know, in their off time hacking together these sort of vi- little video games, uh, which, you know, video games at the time didn't really exist. So, but then they, be- they became, you know, just a few years later, uh, you know, this huge cultural phenomenon, but they were basically developed by the mili- by military contractors uh, at the time. And he said, yes, you know, these guys are working for the military. And yes, they're military contractors. But that's all just irrelevant because 
who, the, who these guys are radicals. These guys are. They might be taking money from the Pentagon, but the Pentagon doesn't even realize that what these guys are building, this new technology that's gonna that's gonna connect everybody, it's gonna be this sort of unified uh, society, global society where we're all connected together. We won't even need to have strife. We don't need. We would need to have governments. We would need to have borders to defend because the internet would be this global platform, democratic platform that would underlie the world and create create this kind of leap into this world that we can barely even just fathom, you know? That this is what these guys were doing. They weren't actually building tools of surveillance or or, or war. They were building tools of liberation. And, and he's pushing back against the protesters at, at this time. Yes, yes. And he's saying that actually the true radicals are not the ones who are uh, protesting the, the war uh, and occupying campuses or working with, you know, in, in inner cities uh, to try to uh, empower uh, black communities. You know, these people are kind of working on an older idea of how politics work. So they're trying to do politics. Politics are kind of like, eh. You know, that's, oh, they're over. We've seen what politics do. Politics create corrupt governments. They create corrupt corporations, right? Um, what these guys in, this, in these, you know, military labs are doing are, is creating a new way of, of, of thinking about the world. You're kind of escaping politics. They're not political. They, they're above politics. And uh, so, you know, and he said that these guys are the real radicals. Like, they might not, they might not you know, uh, be protesting. They're not loud and they're quiet and they're... In, uh, but they are the one. They are the true. They're they're, they're going to be the true inheritors of the counterculture, uh, and so he he was really instrumental in in um, in sort of really first um, uh, outlining this idea of of, of computer engineers and uh, as as the most radical element of society. Is is it just a rebranding, or or is is there some truth to what he's saying? Well, I mean, it's hard. It's, I mean, it's. I think it's. 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 He's spinning a mythology, and I think there's truth in the sense that, you know, this technology will. Um, he he might have believed it. I mean, so truth is a strange thing. He probably believed it was true, and I'm sure he believed it. Uh, and a lot of people believed it because. A lot of people uh, still do believe it, and people still believe it. But I I think, if we look back and look at it historically, we we have the benefit of of hindsight, right? Um, it was yes, it was it was myth making, um, because what it did it was it ignored power, right? What he did is he ignored the the the, the entities that are f underwriting all this research. So sure, the kids you know who are building it might have long hair and they're probably they're smoking dope. They got Lord of the Ring posters, you know, in their cubicles. Sometimes they might even go to an anti-war protest or two, you know. Uh, they're listening to the Grateful Dead. They're hanging out in San Francisco, uh, dropping acid, you know, hanging out in communes. Um, yeah, and you know they're serious when they got the Lord of the Ring uh, oh yeah, posters yeah. before these movies ever come out. And we're talking about the book now. Well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, no, but it was interesting because because Palantir is uh, so it's this um, it's this um, company that um, sells essentially surveillance um, intelligence management software to mil to military so that you can ingest all, all this data and you, you can extract uh, information from it. So, so it's actually called Palantir, you know, and Palantir is one of the, like this, the, the wizards see these rocks where they can allow, they, it allows them to communicate with and see, oops, and see the world um, <laughs> in real life. Someone just hit the microphone. I don't know who that was. Yeah. I, I, Came out of nowhere. They'll, no, they won't even notice. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so look, they're, they're, they're fans of Lord, Lord's, Lord of the Rings, um, but like what, what Stuart Brand's vision might have been naive and he believed it, I'm sure, but it, w it was obviously going to fail because um, what he did is he, un he, he ignored power, right? So who controls the money? Why are, these, why are these programs being lavishly funded by the Pentagon? So is the Pentagon really funding technology that will make it obsolete? I mean, on the face of it, it just sounds you know, naive and silly. Uh, the Pentagon doesn't do that. In fact, it will will viciously uh, attack anybody who, who threatens its power, you know, and, 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 and so, um, you know, and ARPA uh, was a part of that. And so you, you're, you're ignoring the historical, political, um, and geopolitical sort of forces that are swirling and that are underwriting the, these computer programs. And so they might be, the kids might be all right, but they, they are still... Um, they're still, um, you know, held aloft by 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 power of some kind, and so when you ignore the, that power and you ignore uh, its objectives or what it's trying to do, uh, then you're, you know, you're you're really not talking about anything real, right? And, and it's and so I think he believed it, uh, and he um, would go on to be very influential, and he, you know, he, Wired magazine. 
is essentially created by people who were directly inspired by his vision, you know, and, and they were wired magazine was sort of like the whole earth catalog of for the for the internet for the internet you know for the dot com boom and in fact people who worked for wired were um you know like proteges of Stuart brand of this yeah. guy yeah so help, help me we're gonna have to speed up a little bit in time frame and really there's a lot to talk about here we could easily go a couple hours we, we don't have a couple of hours mm. however i did see videos of you on youtube and some of them actually go 90 minutes and stuff so if they want more of this conversation <laughs> they can do that uh, on other interviews that you've done um but then then help me reconcile that to where and you write about this in surveillance valley how then we see and give the internet so much credit for things for, you know, start starting what happened in Tunisia and then in Egypt in 2011. Uh, WikiLeaks obviously is very much uh, related to that, which which we see again as these things of being able to oppose the state, oppose the power. Of course, I mean, and uh, look, the internet has been an incredible tool uh, to allow um, uh, very quick, uh, rapid mobilization and um, of of. of huge crowds of people and uh, without without existing even political structures or organizational structures um and so you can it it's allows people to organize around an emotional issue of some kind very quickly yeah. uh and, and the black lives matter me yeah. too all these things exactly 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 and so and in some cases they even you can get enough momentum moving that that you can actually even topple a, a, you know a, a government and uh, by doing that but then I think you know what what Arab Spring showed and what Egypt showed. You know, let's say if we you know take that that example is that once you once that happens, right? What what comes after the this ups, upswelling of of, yeah, of, of grassroots of grassroots yeah. energy, right? Is who comes into that vacuum, right? And so you it's always going to be uh, entities or movements or political organizations that have existing on the ground um, uh, structures. And so Muslim it was, Brotherhood, boom! You know, yeah. Muslim Brotherhood came in, and, and and democratically too. You know, it was and 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 so you saw. But after that, you saw this very same people who were, um, um, you know, basically were also. Uh, the, so you so you had the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and then that was overthrown in a military coup that was supported by by a lot of the people who were actually out in the streets in their Arab Spring. And so you have very strange thing where yes, the internet has this this deceptive quality, right, where it's. It does allow you to, to interact with anybody. It, 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 it allows people to organize. It allows WikiLeaks to run a website where it can publish things like, you know, secrets. But it's also um, uh, in, a bit of an illusion, right? Because you still need the, the real world structures behind it to have any kind of effect. And so, you know, um, the Internet looks chaotic, looks, looks like an, almost like an anarchic kind of uh, landscape. But you also have to understand that the internet is private property, you know. So, you know, the internet is entire as an as as a, as a network of of, of platforms and and and, uh, and uh, internet service providers, right? It's all private. It's all private property. Yeah. So, like, you know, it's no different than Walmart or 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 uh, or Target or or uh, or the you know, Shell gas station. It's like you can use those these things and you can go and fill up your gas and you pay for it, or you can go and Walmart, you know. You can either buy something or you just sit in the food court and not do anything, right? But, like, you have no right to be there. I mean, you only have as much right as Walmart gives you. You can be kicked out of there and you have no uh, recourse of any kind. You don't, you don't have a, a right to be on private land. Well, who owns the Internet? Well, co companies like Google, companies like Facebook, companies like Verizon, companies like Time Warner. Can, can you... And I guess there's the the dark web. I don't know. That might be a completely different thing. Again, I'm coming at this as a novice. Um, but it, can can you access the regular internet without having to go through any of these companies? No, well, it, that they are the internet. I mean, what is the regular internet? The, so the regular internet is. I mean, you can create your. You know, there's people who want to create their own local internets, uh, like community internets, where you are just networking your you know people's computers. And you can do that, uh, and it'll be restricted to the little local area. But in order to connect to the internet, you have to go through a private company of some kind because they are the ones who, who that is the internet. So the internet, it's like, it's like, can you, it's like using if you have AT and T, you know, or, or like you, you know, making yeah. a phone call. Yeah. It's like you, you, you know, there's a phone booth, but it's a private company that you're making a phone call with, right? And so, and you because it's so easily accessible, with you, we think of it as a. 
as a public thing, and you know, at least the phone was regulated as a public utility. Um, so it had you had some protections over that, and you had access to people. But the internet is not regulated as a public utility. It's not seen as a public utility in the face of, in, in in as far as American law is concerned, and American regulatory structures are concerned. Did, did that just change because of net neutrality rules, or no? Uh, pre- n- that? Yeah. Uh, um, sorry, I didn't mean to re- interrupt. No. Um, okay. Yes and no. Uh, net neutrality that was uh, enacted under uh, under President Obama um, went by, like took a little tiny little uh, shuffle towards that, but but it very explicitly stopped short of that because it only enforced parts of um, the Telecommunications Act of Title II of the Telecommunications Act that that gave that allowed um, sort of that that, that prevented. You know, companies from uh, charging extra for 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 priority service or premium service, internet service providers charging extra, um, but it didn't regulate the internet or didn't classify the internet as a public utility. Although it it sends power that was in uh, that was in the power of the Obama administration. I mean, it's in the power of Donald Trump to do it. I mean, his his uh, FCC chairman. Um, it's in it's in the power of the government to do that, but that that doesn't even exist. So we use these private companies. To 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 operate on a, in a, in a on private property, and so we can you can be banned from Facebook tomorrow. You have no recourse. You have no legal recourse. Right. You can be banned from Google tomorrow. Go to Facebook you, jail. That's exactly. A well, you, you, for instance, you could <laughs> I be, have friends who've gone to there. You could be. You know, something could happen. You could lose your Gmail account. You could lose all of the emails. Yeah, well. that would. I thought about that. If I thought as I, we began our conversation, I almost really has become my Rolodex. Well, if I were to lose that, can you imagine? That's a that's yeah. a that would be a huge loss. And you, yeah. But you you I don't, you have no legal recourse to yeah. get that back. And so, um, and so, you know, we we because most of us are you know are allowed to we, um, use the internet, and we're not banned from any place. Just like we're not banned from Walmart, and we're not banned from Chevron, you know, fill, gas stations and things like that. As long as right. you play by the rules. Yeah, as long as there's no problem, so we don't think about it. But 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 the same rules that govern our access to Walmart are the same rules that govern our access to the internet. You know, and so and so it's important to think about that because. You know, we think in, in, in also in, in 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 the context of you know something like the Arab Spring or something like even you know Bernie Sanders. You know, because Bernie Sanders' campaign was really built on the internet, <clears throat> and it was he was able to rapidly mobilize with no in, in existing infrastructure and almost take out Hillary Clinton. I mean, it was really impressive, right? But he, it hinged on the internet and the ability to raise money through the internet. He could be banned from any one of those platforms like this, you know, for whatever reason. Um, of course, it would cause a political outcry and it would be an outrage. But it's all—it's important to remember that he's—he even as a as a senator, you know, and as a, as a presidential candidate, I don't think had a, has a right to be there, you know, um, which is weird to think about, right? Um, because so much of public life now is occurring on there. Yes. So so much of civic participation. Yeah. Of, of on on every level. Yeah. From the personal to the to to the public and to the political, and so. So I, I think it's important for us to think about it in that in that way because if we are really going to uh, I mean the internet is not going away right so we're gonna li- we're living with this technology and it's gonna be more and more intertwined with our lives and from the point of view of a you know political perspective you know we're gonna we're gonna need to um, somehow take a hold of it politically and democratically and to <clears throat> to make it. I don't know, work for, for people rather than just these giant corporations. And so in order for us to, to begin to grab a hold of it, we need to understand its history and, and what it is. We have to, we have to really um, try to rid ourselves of the mythology that we've been fed because it, it, I think it, it, it hampers um, any kind of future political a- action. Uh, let, let, let's end on talking about the profiles, again, that have been created for all of us now who, who use the Internet. And you begin... Your book and your introduction of Surveillance Valley, actually uh, in Oakland, in downtown Oakland, going to a city hall meeting uh, or a hearing over a very controversial issue a number of years ago called Domain, the Domain Awareness Center. And, and it's kind of reminded me, and you write about this too, I remember the Bush administration, and, and maybe you can even tell us where it is now, but, but I remember when I was covering Capitol Hill, there was a lot of concern about, what was it called, total information yeah. awareness? Yeah, n- yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The total information awareness system. Are these the same thing, kind of the domain awareness center? And, I mean, I mean similar. Yeah, I mean, I think they're based on the same idea. It's you want to you the, the the total information awareness system is a sort of yeah Bush administration um, project um, w- that sought to create a a computer network system that could again take ingest all data that is available to you know to the military or to the intelligence agencies. I mean, going from surveillance cameras you know on the street to 
to, to people's emails and uh, financial transactions, right? And so, like, you, you know, as an, as an analyst, you could sit there and just have, like, okay, what are these people doing? Oh, I you can know? only imagine what Ethiel does for Lapu, yeah. I think. Hope I mean, he'd be, he'd, be, he'd, be, he'd love it, I think. <laughs> he, would be, he would be all for it because he was, he was in many ways, a, one of the, you know, he's forgotten now, but, uh, but he was very, very influential at the time. And, um, um, and he wasn't alone, but he was in a very influential thinker about these kinds of systems. I mean, so in, 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 in Oakland, of course, you had a smaller version of the sort of, to, you know, uh, total information awareness systems called the Domain Awareness uh, Center, DAC. Uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, planned in response to Occupy Wall Street and in particular um, some of the threats that came to the Port of Oakland. Um, um, it was after we have Occupy Oakland and yes, everything that ex happened. Exactly, exactly, yeah. uh, exactly. So it was, very, it was a very uh, active movement here, um, probably one of the most active in the countries politically because this, this place is very actively active politically in general. And so... Um, and there were a lot of uh, there was a march on the port of Oakland to shut it down. I mean, there was so it originated, I think, as as a, as a defensive measure against the port of Oakland. So you could have cameras and things like that, and, and you can give it you know feed into a centralized um, intelligence hub where the police can sit and sort of see what's going on. But then it expanded to a citywide plan project um, to to integrate every kind of intelligence feed you can you can get so you have the you know public uh cameras you have the traffic cameras you have even cameras on private property you like loop it all in into this into the center then you can loop in social media activity right so you can see if there's a protest you can immediately zero in on what it is who's there what are they doing like what's the, what are their objectives and so and you have the algorithms the computer programs to do the analysis exactly exactly is this like predictive policing at all i mean i i don't i don't know if i'm sure that I don't think at that stage was uh, they were talking about predictive policing. Uh, although I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that was an aspect of it, because there was a multi, there was like mul there were multiple phases to it, as far as I understand. There were sort of like different stages of different components that you could plug into this thing. Uh, and so, um, and what I what I was really astounded to find out, actually, a local uh, some local activists tipped me off to some to some um, documents that they were, were able to obtain through. Um, 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 you know, sort of uh, freedom information um, um, laws um, from the Oakland government is that Google. So the contract was given out to this major military contractor called SAIC, uh, and, and but Google also was behind the scenes trying to get a piece of the action, to piece of the, a piece of this contract, and and they there was uh, based on these emails that I was able to re get. There were multiple meetings between Oakland officials and um, uh, the sort of uh, um, a Google a Google manager who handles uh, government contracting work, and um, about demoing ver various things. And th th there was a, you know even a follow up meeting scheduled, but that was it. It was very it was like a little breadcrumb. You know, Google was there and wanted to get a cut of this very very controversial police um, surveillance center that was. I mean, it was really controversial. I mean, it was it was a very yeah. going to the city hearings. Um, uh, city council hearings about audit, and it was very, I mean, it was packed to the hilt. People were really rowdy. People were really against it. I mean, the community mobilized against it in a major way. And um, and here you had Google, you know, the the kind of the progressive, nice guys. Do no evil. Do no evil, trying to get, like, you know, a, a component of some kind of the surveillance uh, uh, center. And so, you know, I it was one of these early breadcrumbs that ultimately led me to write this book because I wanted to understand, it's like, okay, what could Google possibly be offering this controversial police yeah. surveillance? Well, what is Google offering? Yeah. We have like a minute. But. Yeah, well, I mean, what is it? Well, exactly. What is it? Well, it's, it's, it's offering a component of the total information awareness, you know? So I'm not sure what it was uh, offering because I was never able to get a response from Oakland. They stonewalled me. And Google is harder to talk to than the CIA. And yeah. so, I mean, it could have been a number of things. Probably it could have been the mapping technology. You know, uh, the, like Google Earth. And, of course, of, now Google's on the forefront of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe Oakland a little bit, maybe it doesn't have the money to uh, to, to buy that. I don't know. I'm just, uh, <laughs> it might be a premium, premium product, you know, for something like New York City. Uh, but, uh, no, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's, um, it's unclear what they were offering. But they were offering something. And what they offer other entities are, of course, um, when, you, when you look at their other contracting work, you can see what they offer. Yeah. yeah I mean, so uh, they offer... Um, um, again, mapping technologies that could that could ha that, that 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 underpin predictive policing uh, um, uh, uh, programs, and so it works closely with predictive policing um, um, contractors, 
because everything, all this intelligence usually needs to be put on a map, and Google has the best technology for that in one case, you know. There's also, you can rent out cloud computing that you can, you know, crunch numbers and do analysis for, so you can outsource that, 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 that work. Google offers a lot of different things. Um, of course, you can just have collaborative document editing or collaborative, you know, um, sort of discussions between, um, you know, in this, in this fusion center. So Google has like a one-stop solution for a lot of back office stuff, you know, and, and sort of underlying technology to visualize in, in data and intelligence. So um, it, it, offered, it offers, it sells that stuff to the, to the NSA, it sells that stuff to the CIA, it sells that stuff to the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security. So, you know, mil Google is a military contractor already. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me that um, it would offer some of its um, services to Oakland and to this police this center. Yeah. Yes, sir, Levine. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but that, that was interesting. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a great talk. Again, Yasha Levine has been our guest. The name of his book is Surveillance Valley, The Secret Military History of the Internet. And like I said, I mean, you got some long videos on, on YouTube from other interviews. <laughs> I have that, no idea what those oh, videos yeah. are of. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who's been filming me. <laughs> don't watch that. Don't Whatever you find, it's not yeah, true. No. Not true. Well, well, very interesting, actually. I'll show you what I saw <laughs> afterwards. Uh -oh. Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks. That does it for Letters and Politics. Deanna Martinez is our producer. Lucille Rousseau is our intern. And Kirsten Thomas is our engineer. You can listen to our archive shows at kpfa.org. I'm Ed Jezrich, and I thank you for listening.
Hey everyone, this is Mitch Jesrich, and I'm very happy to tell you that our winter fun drive is over. Now, on behalf of everyone at KPFA, I want to thank you dearly for your generous support. Now, we did fall short of our overall goal, but we did keep our part of the bargain by ending on time. Now, if you're a listener that intended to pledge, well, you can still do so by going online at kpfa.org. Our thank you guests are all still available. Remember, you are essential in keeping KPFA on the air, and so we encourage you to donate today. kpfa.org. Thank Thank you. Radioactive Resistance is a benefit for KPFA Radio and DACA support services. Featuring multi Grammy Award winner Arturo O'Farrell and the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra, the Bobby Cespedes Band, and the Son Jarocho All Stars, plus special guests. Saturday, May 12, 7 30 p.m. at the UC Theater, 2036 University Avenue in Berkeley. For more information, visit theuctheater.org. Support listeners.